Um, hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm Michelle Roberts and I'm the Physical Activity and Health Programme Lead for a group of charities called the Richmond Group. And today I would like to talk to you a bit more about how we can help people with long-term conditions to move more. Um, so talking a little bit about what do we know about people with long-term conditions and their sort of attitudes and behaviours around physical activity, uh, what we as a group of organisations doing about that, helping them to become more active um, and there's a particular spotlight from my wonderful colleague uh, Jenna Peel from the Alzheimer's Society. She's unfortunately not able to join in person um, so um, she, she has recorded a uh, presentation for you which is it, she's sort of segued into mine so unfortunately if you've got any questions for her she's not going to be around to answer them but um, hopefully you'll enjoy her presentation nonetheless. Um, so before I kind of get started, um, some of you may or may not be aware of uh, who the Richmond Group of Charities are, so I thought it would be good just to kind of set the scene and explain, explain who we are and what we do. So um, we're a group of health and care charities and our aim is to support people that live with long-term conditions to get access to the care and support they need when they need it wherever they live in England. Um, and we have a physical activity programme of work called Movement for All which we work with other partners beyond our kind of membership group. So uh, MIND, the MS Society uh, and Parkinson's UK. Um, and also importantly, we work with Sport England and we have uh, national lottery funding from them uh, to deliver all of our uh, sort of shared outcomes around increasing physical activity. Um, this is something that's really, uh, really important. It, it is something that sort of, uh, I suppose, intersects and cuts across all of the, the work of the charities um, that we do, uh, we've got a lot of prioritisation around sort of uh, supporting people with particularly multiple long-term conditions um, and also looking at how we can address um, health inequity. So for us, the sort of physical activity focus um, really sort of sits neatly uh, across those two other big themes. And one of the things that we really want to do is see how we can sort of change some of the narrative around um, what it means to be active and help to obviously change the behaviours uh, of, of people with long-term conditions. So um, some of this stuff might just be really tedious that you're already really aware of, um, but I'm kind of the mindset that um, you kind of just have to keep saying things over and over and over again, um, just in case there is anyone that, that hasn't heard it before um, and that it might sort of prompt something that's of sort of use and of interest. So uh, bear with me if, if you're seeing this um, and you've seen it many times before. But I just feel like it's really important to kind of state sort of why physical inactivity matters, uh, and not just to us as a, a group of charities, but for, for you guys in your role, for individuals, for a uh, kind of collective society I suppose and that's because it really does have a significant impact as you kind of heard from some of the speakers um, this morning like Jamie sort of setting out the scene um, really I just want to kind of add to that that um, NHS sort of data uh, for England tells us that N um, over 16 year olds uh, with a long-term condition that's 43% of our population which I think is quite a, a sort of a staggering number um, and what's even more staggering I think is when you start to look at the number of people with multiple long-term conditions now the estimates of um, you know how many people live with those it's sort of roughly between sort of 15 and 30 depending on the source there's lots of different national and local data sources but the, the critical thing here is we're expecting to see that number increase by 2035 to about 68% of our population. So we're talking about the norm moving forwards and that's something we really need to be aware of. It is coming. Um, the other thing um, that you'll be very familiar with is this sort of, um, the sort of inequity within sort of physical activity. Um, and unfortunately, people with long-term conditions are twice as likely um, to be inactive as people without long-term conditions. Um, and the more long-term conditions or impairments you have, the less likely you are to be active. Um, so it really is quite a, a, a wicked challenge. But we do know, obviously, that um, physical activity is beneficial for us. So there's um, up to 40% of long-term conditions can be, um, sort of the risk of those can be reduced through activity, and there's sort of over 20 conditions for which uh, activity can really support uh, management. So it's a really uh, useful, important tool. Um, and the kind of the horror stat is the, the one about the one in six deaths are estimated as a result of physical inactivity in the UK. So that's the one that kind of 
um, is, is the, the real shocker. Um, what I always find interesting is that physical activity, you know, it has been referred to as a, a kind of a wonder drug because it does do so many things like manage stress, improve quality of life, aid sleep, and help to reduce socialisation. So it really is something that is important. Um, and there's a whole host of other reasons that I'm going to talk through about why it's important as well. And um, obviously, it would be remiss of me not to mention uh, COVID-19 because it has had a massive impact on everybody. But in particular, people with like, living with long-term conditions, um, I think it's been uh, very significant um, in terms of the psychological effects potentially of um, shielding for such a long, number, um, long amount of time. Um, we also know from um, our research and other research that there's been quite a significant amount of deconditioning going on where people have, um, you know, just not been able to be as active as, as they have been. And also, if they haven't been able to access um, their kind of usual care and support, um, health interactions um, and routine kind of appointments, there's, there's been a bit of a degradation in a lot of people's conditions as well. So um, that's, that's definitely had um, a big impact on people. Um, one thing I really uh, kind of wanted to highlight was that I'm talking sort of in general um, sort of sense in terms of the, the population with long-term conditions, but I just wanted to point out the fact that 25% of our NHS workforce uh, live with a long-term condition, and we know that 30% of those are inactive, and I think that they're a really important group of people for us to consider at the moment. I mean, obviously, we've, um, you know, the last couple of years, we've seen that there's a really high level of burnout um, within the sort of health and care workforce, but even before that, um, you know, we saw that there were sort of abs absence rates that were often related to sort of stress, mental health problems, and also musculoskeletal issues. So I think that's an audience we really need to consider. Um, there's six million people nearly that are sitting on waiting lists now um, who could really benefit from being more active um, to help them manage their symptoms, help reduce the risk of deterioration of their conditions, uh, manage the psychological impact of waiting, um, and just sort of help them with um, stay healthy, really, if they're waiting for a long time for treatment. So um, that's that's another thing that, um, you know, being, being active can really support those people in that kind of um, treatment journey and that wait. Um, interesting thing from our um, research is that uh, people with long-term conditions really want advice and support from the NHS, from like reassuring um, sort of health uh, professionals in terms of how how they can be active and just encouragement to be active. And I think that's a, a point sort of worth making, really, um, that people are interested and they 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 you know they do want um, that kind of support um, potentially. Um, and an, another kind of point there about almost two thirds of people with mental health conditions have also suggested that they'd like physical activity uh, to be offered alongside medication in their sort of treatment and recovery process. So it's sort of just part and parcel really of, um, of their kind of care and support. Um, I have just been um, talking and uh, trying to explain why this is important, but I think what's always best is when you talk to somebody that lives with a long-term condition and can explain the importance of that in their own words. So I'm hopefully going to be able to show you a video of um, John, who's one of our wonderful We're Undefeatable ambassadors, so bear with me. Hopefully this is going to work. Nope. Uh, okay. <sighs> Yeah. Parkinson's is a very powerful condition. The frustration is massive. Yet when I see a football, it takes me back 20 years. My wife, Tracy, gives me everything that I need. She's given up an awful lot. I'm lucky, but I know that there are people who sat in a dark corner for a long time. The importance of having a support network can't be underestimated. We set up our weekly game between the Parkinson's guys and the stroke recovery team. This group has been a ray of light shining in their life. We want to put the smile back on faces of people with Parkinson's and remind them that there's still a life to live. Cheers. Steve, relax. You know we're shaky at the back, though, so that's... <laughs> and we just look forward to people joining us to come and share our better life with Parkinson's. Good one. <laughs> when you're ready. It's not the end, it's, it's just a different beginning. Um, I always love the way that he ends that by saying it's not the end, it's just a different beginning. Because I think it just brings in the spirit of the fact that, you know, you may have 
a diagnosis of something that is going to change your life and that may potentially deteriorate over time and that's going to have really wide-ranging impacts, not on your, just yourself, but on your family and friends. But that sort of, um, yeah, spirit of uh, trying to sort of find your way through and navigate that and try and sort of stay as upbeat as possible. Um, but um, anyway, um, so yeah, I always think that it's really best to, to hear from those individuals themselves in terms of the importance of physical activity for them, what it means for them. Um, what are we doing um, and is any of that working? Well, um, we, as I mentioned before, have got our physical activity programme, which is Movement for All. And um, this has actually been um, a programme that's been running for, I mean, I've been in the role for five years, but I inherited from, from someone else. So it's, it's been going and gathering steam for some time. Um, and really, I suppose the important um, elements are that it is a programme that's beyond our kind of Richmond Group members. Um, and it's, it's been supported all of the way by our um, colleagues at Sport England. Um, and one of the things that's sort of uh, central to that is that we kind of created a kind of a community of practice with our sort of charity partners. And that's enabled us to kind of create a peer support network where we're able to sort of share learning, talk about sort of challenges and opportunities as a collective, and basically enable us to be more than the sum of our parts. So that's kind of been really um, a kind of, a sort of integral, I suppose, to our collaboration work. Um, and what we've done basically is create a sort of a number of different intervention projects and insight projects that have been funded by Sport England to, in order to kind of gather a rich um, bank of insights and resources um, to sort of understand what works, what some of the barriers are um, and, you know, how we can sort of go about doing things a bit differently. Um, to help us to do that, we created a sort of a shared, well, a theory of change and then a sort of a shared um, outcomes framework with, with shared outcomes measures. And then we've synthesised all of the sort of the data and the, the insight to create our um, evaluation report, which we released earlier this year. So I do recommend um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a long read. So bedtime reading potentially, but the good news is you can skip between sections that are a bit more interesting to you. So hopefully I haven't sold that and unsold that at the same time, but it's on our website, so um, recommend that. It's got lots of useful kind of learning and recommendations about um, how we've sort of looked, um, our partners have looked at embedding physical activity into their organisations in terms of their system and culture, um, how we've worked together in collaboration in real life, and I'm not saying we've got all the answers, we haven't, but we've just done things in a particular way, and it's most of the time worked for us. Um, there's also been some tips about, you know, how we've set up and run um, and evaluate physical activity behaviour change projects, um, and there's, particularly if you're, you're interested in evaluation and all of that kind of stuff, there was some really useful bits and pieces in there. Um, one of the other things we've done is create a, a suite of videos called Make Your Move. Um, and these were really a kind of a gap that we spotted sort of during COVID-19 when obviously a lot of content was digitised and moved online. Um, and so what we wanted to do is create some hard copy DVDs to send out to people that might not be able to get access to that, um, those resources or feel overwhelmed. Because one of the things we found through our research that we carried on through throughout COVID was that people were feeling well, just totally overwhelmed by the amount of, com you know, content, information, not just about physical activity, about everything, because there's just so much going on. Um, but these have been um, developed with our audience, um, with instructors that are, are just really kind of relatable um, and sort of reassuring. Um, and yeah, just to really kind of help to give people different layers of um, levels of accessibility as well. And uh, the wonderful uh, Dr. Andrew Boyd also did a little bit of an intro for us, for which we're very grateful. Um, we uh, also have created a, a sort of a resource pack. So this is basically our opportunity to pull together what we know about physical activity and long-term conditions and try to sort of tailor it and distill it for different audiences. So we've got one that's aimed at the health and care workforce, one that's aimed at health and care organisations, and then one that's aimed at the sport and physical activity sector. So it's to make that information as relevant to those um, organisations as possible. And really to think about, like, there's sort of four key um, ways that we think um, we could make a difference in terms of really shifting that dial and getting more people with long-term conditions to be active. So again, that's that's on our website, and I um, recommend you sort of take a look at it because it's just it's got lots of really useful case studies and signposting to, to useful resources in it as well. Um, I mentioned a number of charity projects, so I just want to kind of uh, skip through 
skip through these. Um, we basically had a number of different projects that were interventions and insights. So we had two projects that were kind of peer support projects and two projects that were helpline projects. Um, and then, as I said, sort of a number of um, projects just looking at research. So Age UK um, was looking at uh, research, and you can see the report there one step at a time. ASME UK also undertook a research project, and that was more specifically looking barriers um, barriers for children and the effect of parents, coaches and teachers on physical activity. Um, Breast Cancer Now also um, did some research as well, looking at women over 50 um, who were inactive. Um, Diabetes UK, you can see their sort of learning report there. They actually use that as a springboard to go and create a whole new uh, community project. They're doing a lot of work in the West Midlands, specifically targeting um, sort of ethnic minority communities. So that's been a really great opportunity for them. Um, and we've also uh, had uh, Versus Arthritis have done a similar thing. So they've now got a really great project. And some of you may have come across Let's Move with Leon, which is one of their kind of assets. Um, so, but the, 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 the intervention projects were led by uh, the MS Society, um, the British Lung Foundation, uh, Rethic Mental Illness and the Stroke Association. Um, and that, they were really sort of interesting. So they weren't quite the same. There was sort of, they had similarities and differences about how they went about helpline coaching and peer support, but some really useful stuff in there, particularly about um, how important it is to sort of nest messages about physical activity and wider motivations and interests. So like how you could kind of gain independence or maintain independence or, you know, play more with your children or your grandchildren and things like that. Um, and the social aspects of physical activity being really, really fundamental. Um, and you can also see here the Alzheimer's Society Dementia Friendly Guide. So this was really a response to the fact that there was a sense that um, people with Alzheimer's not necessarily being able to access uh, leisure and sport facilities. Um, and because of the sort of the nature of dementia, there's so many different things that are at play, like sensory, cognitive, mobility, kind of different impairments that I suppose if you're making somewhere dementia friendly, you're making it really inclusive and accessible to a lot of a lot of people um, so that's just sort of a quick um, run through our projects our charity projects and then um, I just wanted to, to briefly touch upon the we're undefeatable campaign um, so this is a campaign that we launched in 2019 um, it's award-winning I hope I'm allowed to say that um, but it's um, basically just a, a campaign that we've we've set up with our charity partners and Sport England um, and it's basically put, it's completely to sort of try and change the way that we talked about physical activity with long -term, people with long-term conditions. Because what people told us when we were doing our research was, um, you're kind of talking to us all wrong, um, you're scaring the bejesus out of us by telling us to do 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity, what is that? Um, so, you know, can we have this a little bit more sort of achievable and relatable? Um, so what we've done is really created a, a, a sort of a, a campaign that's about movement, encouraging people to move more, and it's got real life stories at the heart of that. So John's story that I, I, I played, John is one of our wonderful ambassadors, and we've got about 25 now, all really different stories, really diverse people, but representing people with long-term conditions and telling the story in their own words about how they found a way to be active, even if they've got sort of multiple conditions, the physical and mental health conditions. So that's really at the crux of it. Um, and it's um, been a fantastic opportunity for us to kind of try and get those messages out there and also make people with long-term conditions visible. So we've done a lot of high-profile sort of TV ads over the last few years, and we know that we've reached sort of millions of people um, through those. But one of the things that's been really great to get us feedback is just how people feel like they've been seen, because sometimes people with long-term conditions feel like their condition is invisible and people don't necessarily understand. Um, so it's, I think that's been some really positive feedback we've had. It's not, it's not just about the physical activity element of it. But the campaign, it has been audience-tested and you know we've used research and evidence to, to build it and continue to use that to help us to shape it and you can see some of the tools we've got here uh, team undefeatable um, was a kind of like a, a sort of a team uh, project we've, we've got some um, tools that we um, worked with uh, sort of dance coaches and uh, walking football coaches to create that and then um, the My Daily Undefeatable is a sort of a support tool it's almost like a coaching tool to help people to find their sort of motivations overcome barriers um, and we cre curated some uh, YouTube playlists um, with inclusive activity videos, not just from our charity partners, but from beyond that, um, that we knew that were sort of really accessible, really inclusive, 
um, and we did that particularly ramped that up during COVID. Um, so, uh, and another thing we did during COVID was create a 15 ways to be active at home leaflet. And that again, to sort of respond to the fact that people were feeling a bit overwhelmed. So we did actually print, uh, I think maybe 200,000 copies of those and distribute those through partners like active partnerships. Um, so um, we also have a supporters hub. So anyone wanting to support the campaign um, can get uh, access to our image library, uh, the messaging, insight packs that we've got. We've got loads of insight packs. We've loads of really useful stuff. Do encourage you to go and sign up to that. Um, there's learning from 10 activation areas that Sport, in Sport England funded separately to help bring the campaign to life in local areas. Um, for example, Blackpool, uh, Liverpool, Bolsover, Durham, um, those kind of places where there's a high sort of prevalence of people with long-term conditions. Um, and there's just sort of really helpful kind of good practice um, advice in there as well. So um, this, this is a sort of a, you know, a really uh, fundamental kind of part of our programme of work because it really was about trying to sort of shift, shift the dial and sort of change the narrative um, around physical activity. Um, so some, I just want to do a, a kind of a quick run through of some of the um, insights uh, that we've got around uh, physical activity um, and barriers. I don't want to linger too much on the sort of negativity, but it, it's just really important to understand um, that there are basically quite complex overlapping barriers to physical activity for our audience. So top of the, the top of the tree always over the last few years that we've been running our sort of uh, research and evaluation is pain. Pain is always right up there, um, followed by fatigue, followed by worries about making your condition worse and about the unpredictability of long-term conditions. So it's all condition barriers. So then, as well as having all of those condition barriers, you've got layers of other kind of barriers that most people kind of experience, which is motivation, confidence, um, access, and then COVID-19 as well. So it just sort of like, it's sort of one thing after another, really. And it's just trying to sort of understand that and bear that in mind when you're kind of talking to people when they have long-term condition and trying to encourage them because it's just, it's not a sort of, as um, uh, you know, as simple as um, saying, okay, we're going to go and fix this thing over here and, and then it's done. It's like there's, there's quite a few different things and interventions that are required for us to be able to kind of really make inroads on this challenge. Um, so in particular, wanted to just highlight that from our kind of research, we've seen that people with mental health conditions are much more likely to cite condition barriers and struggle with low confidence and motivation. Uh, people with mental health conditions, young people and non-white people are all more likely to agree that the pandemic has affected their confidence to be active. And that's a really significant point because I think that's something that's gonna last for quite some time. I do not think that that's gonna um, sort of change quickly. We've been monitoring people's confidence over the last two years and it's, it, it, this seems to be quite an ingrained issue at the moment. Um, the, the condition barriers also increase with age, um, and we see lower motivation as people get older as well. Um, and certainly people with severe and multiple conditions are much more likely to cite their conditions um, as a barrier as well. Um, to touch on COVID a little bit, um, we are still seeing people with a lot of anxiety about catching COVID. Um, over half are worried about exercising close to others and are still preferring to be active at home for that reason. Um, and over a quarter have said that the pandemic has broken their confidence to do activity. Um, we know that digital resources are less likely to be accessed by this audience, so we really have to kind of try and bear that in mind, which is why we've created our DVDs and our leaflets. Um, and uh, we, we've seen that there's been a decrease in fitness and strength um, for more than a third of people that we've spoken to. Um, also, those that we've spoken to have, have mentioned a condition deterioration to do, due to decreased activity and reduced access to services. So um, it sort of feels like it's a slightly bleak picture, but look, the good news. The good news is that the majority of the people that we've spoken to with long-term conditions would like to be more active. So that's a really positive point, you know, that um, we need to try and kind of work with. That, you know, there are a lot of people that kind of recognise that they, they do want to, 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 to see those benefits. They do want support managing their conditions. Um, so it's just us trying to sort of find a way um, in which we can help them to do that. And what's really interesting, so this is the sort of the 64% of figure of people with conditions. If you break down our data by people with multiple conditions, um, long-term depression and anxiety, the figure rises to 73%. So whilst you're seeing more people um, from that kind of subgroup talking about barriers and lower motivation in some respects, there's also this kind of um, 
uh, drive to actually get more active. Um, one thing that I did want to sort of slip in here, and it sort of come up quite a lot earlier as um, uh, Jamie was talking, uh, was about uh, the, the power of other influences around our people with the long-term conditions. So it's not all on, on, on us um, when we have long-term conditions to try and sort of change our behaviour and be active. There's a lot of support and people, the influences around us that really need to, to help sort of play that part. And that's one of the things that we asked was, you know, um, you know, have you seen a, a healthcare professional um, in the last month? And two thirds had had contact with a health professional. This was in March 2022. Um, and of those, 37% had actually spoken about physical activity. And of those, 55% had thought made, it made them think about being more physically active. So there's a really positive kind of sort of journey here where if we can kind of get more uh, people having conversations with their health professionals about being active, um, it might sort of start that behaviour change kind of process. Um, and obviously the work that uh, Jamie was talking about earlier around moving health professionals is fantastic. Um, the progress they've made has just been brilliant and um, definitely we just need to kind of continue to see more of that. Um, so uh, in terms of our kind of top takeaways, um, being active needs to feel achievable and relatable. So as I've sort of said, you know, we've kind of been turning people off a bit in terms of uh, talking about sport and exercise. I think people, there's been a perception that everything has to be in a gym, there has to be lots of lycra, scary. Um, so we kind of need to start moving away from that and, you know, talking more about those sort of CMO guidelines, which is, you know, any, any activity is good, more is better. We sort of need to, to sort of really embrace that language. Um, and also try and use a little bit more imagery, like we've got here of like Tanya, who's carrying her shopping, so she's getting her strength, and then she's doing her walking. You know, she's she's getting a sort of a, a good bit of physical activity there. Um, so you know, you don't necessarily have to do structured classes. It's really about finding the right thing for you, and that's going to be the way that it's going to be uh, made to feel a sort of achievable and relatable. And um, so there's quite a lot we need to do around sort of messaging. Um, and marketing, I think, to be able to kind of encourage and reassure people. Um, so I mentioned about uh, living with long-term conditions being unpredictable and the condition barriers being the most cited. Um, and that's definitely, uh, you know, the, the kind of really critical thing here is that, you know, if we're sort of encouraging people to... Um, sort of change their behaviour and be active, it's not necessarily going to be a sort of a linear journey because there's just, you know, you have good days and bad days when you live with a long-term condition. Um, and those condition barriers, when you layer them on top of all of the other barriers that I mentioned, it really, you know, it does kind of, um, uh, you know, create, have quite a significant impact. So um, that's definitely something that we, we really need to kind of bear in mind when we're, in any time of inter intervention that we're, we're developing, um, I mentioned about sort of the motivation and, and confidence and the support changing and sustaining behaviour. And again, it's just trying to, trying to bear in mind uh, that you've got people maybe having good days and bad days again due to the sort of unpredictability of their condition, managing different symptoms that may have a, a, an impact of, on their ability to kind of um, sort of stay uh, engaged with things. And I think I mentioned before about sort of social support. That's, a, that's something that we found is a real kind of crux, really important element of of um, trying to help people along that journey. It's like having that kind of peer support, I suppose, um, is really um, important. I also mentioned about sort of, you know, how you can draw on people's motivation by sort of nesting messaging in, in, in sort of bigger uh, motivational kind of messages, like, you know, as I say, about independence or um, about playing with your children or your grandchildren and things like that, or being able to socialise. It's about kind of what Tracy was talking about, like the what matters, what matters to me, what matters to you kind of thing. Um, I put in here um, slightly obliquely, the system needs to be optimised to encourage and support behaviour change. Um, and basically, I suppose by that, what I'm saying is that we've heard that um, people with long-term conditions, you know, they want help to be active. Um, they do want those conversations about activity. Um, they have highlighted accessibility um, of activity as a, an issue. And I would just um, reiterate sort of Jamie's comment about the Activity Alliance survey um, and research, which I think is being, uh, I think they've got a webinar on Thursday actually to talk through their, their survey, but just highlighting that there are still a lot of really significant 
um, issues that as a collective we need to sort of help to take responsibility and ownership for. So there's only so much that uh, these kind of like marketing campaigns and, and projects can do. We, there's also all of the um, other kind of wider stuff that um, you know we've been hearing about in terms of like active planning and um, you know all of these different opportunities and interactions and teachable moments. Um, so so that's some of our kind of top. Uh, top takeaways for you. Um, next, I've got some slides from Jenna. So basically, this is a kind of spotlight on one of our sort of charity members, and she's going to sort of talk you through um, what they've been doing at the Alzheimer's Society. So I'm going to uh, hand over to her video, and I really hope that this is going to work, because otherwise we've got an extra 10 minutes of chat. So <laughs> here we go. Hi, everyone. Yeah. I'm Jenna, Physical Activity Policy Manager at Alzheimer's Society. Thank you so much for joining our session today, and I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person, um, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity to present alongside Michelle. And um, just say this is a recording, as I'm able to be there, um, but I'd love to get involved in the conversation. So um, if you'd like to get in touch, my email will be at the end of this presentation. So just to introduce Alzheimer's Society, um, we're the UK's leading dementia charity, representing the needs of the 900,000 people living with dementia and their carers. Our work covers three main areas. Um, we campaign for change, we fund research, um, both into how to prevent and find a cure for dementia, as well as research to improve people's lives. And finally, we support people living with dementia today through a wide range of support services. So this led us to the Feel Good folder, um, comprising of different elements, including health information and um, to provide individuals um, with the knowledge on the benefits and to try to change perceptions around what we mean by physical activity. A workbook including evidence-based behaviour change activities to get individuals and their families and carers to think about why they would want to become active and how they might get started, including an activity diary to record progress. A simple wall planner to act as a visual prompt to be active, using stickers to record progress for individually chosen activities. And a set of cards called the Movement Deck which provide activities and um, highlight ideas for activities to try around the home and out and about, as well as inspirational quotes and fun facts. The Feel Good folder will also link to online support. So we'll have a dedicated web page for people affected by dementia, I'm um, showing at the top there, um, with information on how to use their folder, how to access more copies of the activities, an online community for peer support, links to resources such as We Are Undefeatable and Make Your Move videos, inspirational case studies, and also a mover of the month to showcase individual success. We'll also have a dedicated page for health and social care professionals called Movement Matters. This will include information on physical activity, how to use the Feel Good resources, and we'll also have an evidence hub so that we can host things like our evidence review there, and a resource hub so that we can easily signpost to existing resources like Moving Medicine and the Richmond Group Influencing Action Packs. We'll also look to celebrate staff and clinics who are promoting physical activities to their patients here too. So what's next for us? So we're currently designing Feel Good Resources and we'll be going out to test these through um, distributing in three to four memory clinics across England. We'll gather feedback ahead of scaling up and fully evaluating the Feel Good Resources. In parallel to this, we'll begin our second innovation sprint, which is likely to focus more on the role of health and social care workforce in supporting people living with dementia to be active. We'll also be developing the direction for our wider work programme to activate both of these um, innovation solutions and to consider what are the changes we need to implement to support people living with dementia to be active. So it's very much a watch this space. Um, there's lots happening. And um, if any of it has sort of sparked any ideas with you, we'd love to hear from you. So thank you very much um, for joining us today. Thanks so much for listening. Um, my email is there in case you'd like to get in touch and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye. I was going to say thank you, Jenna, but it's a bit weird when she's not there to hear it, but I appreciate the applause and I'll let her know. Um, so, yeah, thank you for listening to us both. Um, I don't know if you've got any questions or reflections um, as to what we've talked about. Um, it's really hard to see because there's a really big light over there, but. <laughs> uh, anybody got any questions? Yeah? I would just like to say that I, I'm involved in wheelchair fencing. Oh, wonderful. And, uh, and it's an activity that can suit anybody, anywhere. Um, 
we, we do um, fencing with all different types of weapons, whether it's... Um, that sounds... <laughs> you might want to qualify that. <laughs> <laughs> we use foam weapons for people okay. that haven't got a proper grip. Yeah. We use plastic weapons for children or people who haven't got proper control over their limbs. And then we use metal weapons, obviously, for people that want to stab and slash each other. Very hmm. oh. And um, we find that uh, people with all types of disability get a great deal of satisfaction by being able to whack somebody without being arrested for it. And, uh, Hands up to that, yeah. Um, and, and it's really good because normally well, we would fence, if you're doing it properly, you fence in a, in a special wheelchair which is clamped into a metal frame. Um, but when we're warming up, we, uh, we, we do it freestyle, so you push your wheelchair and then just batter somebody who comes into the range but with a foot of foam sword. That was good fun. But it's the sort of thing that, that could suit all people of all ages. So if you have people who are elderly and have worked terribly mobile, they could still sit in a chair, an ordinary chair, opposite somebody, and they could still fence. That sounds amazing. And do you know what I really like about it? It's just. Um, the, yeah, you've made it really accessible for people, and I think it's something that people would probably have a preconceived idea that they wouldn't be able to do that. So it's really fantastic, and I think it's definitely something that I'm going to take away to the campaign team, um, because we try to sort of signpost and highlight different activities, because it's about people finding what's right for them. It's about what suits them, and if it's battering people with a piece of foam, that's all good for them. <laughs> you know, it's whatever suits you, so that's, that's fantastic to hear about. Thank you. Um, anybody else got any? Yes? Yeah, hi there. Hi. I was just wondering, um, a lot of the challenge is there's so many different services mm -hmm. around. How can you quickly communicate to patients or GPs just how to access them? So is, and just even looking at that and remembering the yeah. leaflets uh, that are out there, is there sort of a directory of, directory of services or a directory of resources that are national, obviously at local level? Um, that's a really good question, and I don't. I think the short answer might be that it's no. Although I did hear, I think that NASP were looking at developing some directories of services to help at a national level. But obviously, there's been a lot of, as you say, sort of creation of those at a, a local level. I mean, we've got through our resource pack, we've we've collated a lot of resources and. Um, uh, opportunities um, so there's like professional resource but then we have also created a list of like this charity runs this service these this NGB does this thing for aimed at people with long term conditions so we've, we've kind of started to create a bit of a directory but I don't think it exists it probably would be helpful wouldn't it <laughs> I think it would be helpful and I think also maintaining it is probably the biggest challenge mm. that you know, somebody's motivated one year and two years later nothing's up to date yeah. and it's find some way of having a well advertised and up to date directory would be really helpful. Yeah, I mean there was um, years ago there was a, a physical activity directory, wasn't it, the Sport England uh, managed, but I think now they're all kind of yeah, they're local because they've done that, that sort of open data project where they were trying to make it easier to have real time information that was, you know, taking some of the sweat out of updates and stuff like that. But that's yeah, that's a that's a really interesting point. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any other questions. I, I had actually created some questions for you, but we're in an auditorium. I don't know really how easy it is for um, us to talk through any of this. The idea was that you talk to whoever you're sat next to, and like, if there's anything particular you heard that was new, that was interesting, um, you know, if what, is, what is there within your sort of sphere of influence that you could do um, to make a difference for people with long-term conditions? Because there's also, always something that all of us can do. Um, and then the other thing was to what help might you need to take action so we're, we're um, sort of in this for the long haul it's really important to us um, we've got another three years of funding and who knows what happens after that but you know we want to kind of help to sort of shift the dial on this so um, yeah that's that those are the questions and it might be that it's it's something that you want to have a quick chat about now or that you just have a ponder over and think over lunch um, if anyone's got any particular reflections that they want to share with everybody else, then feel free. Anyone brave? <laughs> yes? My only question would be, you have all those partners, 15 of the charity, 
Mm -hmm. um, how do you activate that in a local setup? Because uh, I have HUK and I'm a half of an organization like that, and you have them telling this is super important, and they have the research, they have the guides, but then how do I get my branch to actually mimic that? And I yeah. physical activity. And even if they don't know how to offer, you know, you have some pilots or some activation areas with active partnership. I am not one of them. So again, like how can I do it? What, what's the action I can take as an active partnership to lobby my local charity group? If there is any, sometimes you have one representative for three different counties across active partnerships. So how, you know, what is the next action? Because we keep talking about it's super important, and we have GP saying it's super important, mm. but yet you know, all those like contact points, whether that is with the GP, with the nurse, with the receptionist, with flash driver, the library, you know, nobody is saying it. Like, you know, what, what yeah. is that, you know, there's loads of opportunity to have that message, mm -hmm. but, like, how can we, as an active partnership, lobby system? Yeah, and I, I think that um, the sort of slightly kind of um, simplistic answer to that is that it's just about starting a conversation. As you've heard, like, a bit, you know, already today, it's sort of just trying to do something and sort of make a connection and sort of see where that conversation takes you. I think... It's um, it's a sort of a challenge that we've ex sort of recognised within our kind of national charity members that some of them they're all basically different. So we've got like federated structures in some charities where they've got local local branches. Some of them don't have that at all. So it's really difficult for us to have like a one size fits all kind of approach, which you know would be a terrible idea anyway. But um, what um, so I suppose it's sort of like it's really the onus is on our kind of charity members to work out how best they want to sort of have those conversations if they've got that sort of local structure. And I know that some of that is in process, but I mean, change takes a long time. So it's taken us several years, like three years, to kind of even get people to know about like the campaign and some of the work that we've been doing at a national level, because we're talking about thousands of staff members. We've also then got professional networks and supporters and volunteers. So there's, there's an awful lot of people, I suppose. Um, but I, sp I think it is starting to filter down. And one of the things that the campaign has done is they've created a new activation manager. And the idea of that person is that they're going to go into sort of some local areas and they're going to help to try and join up uh, some of those dots. Because sometimes it is just about somebody having the capacity to help broker, find out who that person is and go and talk to the, that person over there, join up the dots and just start the conversations. Because that's sometimes just the hard bit. So we have got somebody um, that's looking to do that. And it's something that um, at a national level, we want to try and help and see whether or not we have a role and can support to do that as well. So that is a bit of an inconclusive answer, isn't it? But it's a work in progress. <laughs> um, yeah? Have you got, yeah, you? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that I'm standing. I apologize for standing. Yeah, crikey. <laughs> It's a, a very helpful reflection because I, I think that definitely, as you say, you sort of 
shouting about the work that you are doing and that you are making progress, you haven't got all the answers, but you're, you're, you're looking at it, is so important for people to know because it just instantly, people feel like they're welcome. There's a sort of, you know, they just feel like, okay, you are talking to people like me, so this must be important to you. So I'm going to give this a try. And it's a, those little bits of reassurance, I think, that we just need to build up to really um, be able to get people to kind of sort of rediscover hopefully some confidence or discover some confidence. Um, you just reminded me that there was a really good um, rebranding of a gym that I walked past on the way here, um, which was the YMCA, and it was a movement and wellness centre. And I thought, well, that's great. I like that. <laughs> just felt, it felt so much more friendly straight away. Um, I'm really keeping you from lunch now. Uh, so do you, one more, and then... <laughs> Yeah, and oh, you know, if you can do it face to face, all the better. Because hasn't it been fun getting back together face to face again? It's been um, so good. Um, I thank you so much for for coming to this session. I hope it was um, interesting and useful. Thank you. There's some oh, <laughs> there we go. Some links if you want them. So that's my details. If you want to get in touch, thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you.